Today, I'm going to tell you about fixing the damn roof. The roof, if you look at this beautiful place here, it's, it's beautiful. When you walk in, you've got all these lights and everything and pictures on the wall and cameras and things. Let's take the roof off of it. Let's just cut it right off. And let's come back next year and see what we see. We would not want to sit in these chairs. We would not want to hear a presentation because it would be nasty. There would be things crawling around here that we, some of us would understand if we're a scientist. There would be stolen things. There would be just ugly, ugly, ugly things here. And the roof in a child's life is his father. The father protects him, keeps that area of protection over him. You understand? See, my father took the roof off of my life when I was seven years old. And when he took the roof off of my life, all the ugliness of the world crept in that broken ceiling. Pimps and whores and drug dealers. He beat my mother every night. So he became the boogeyman. The boogeyman is really real. You know, I, you know, you grow up and you think, oh, the boogeyman's gonna get you. Some of the kids are being got by the boogeyman. Some of us have never experienced that, but most of us have. Everybody has a boogeyman if they look back in their life. And if it wasn't for a caring adult, their life would be in shambles. I wanna tell you a little bit about my family. In my family, there are 30 men in jail for some degree of murder, 10 for first degree murder. I didn't count the people that were in jail for other things like uh, child molestation or, or things of that nature or assaults or things, they, they were smaller caliber. I mean, not mean that they're not bad things. I just started counting murderers. And it amazed me. I didn't even think, even in my family. And I know each and every one of them, and there was one thing that each and every one of them had in common. The roof was broken. There was no daddy there, and if he was there, he was the wolf. So I was hid, hiding from my daddy most of my childhood life. Can you imagine a child trying to lock his daddy out of the house? I was nailing down windows to keep the boogeyman out. So my family is ravaged with prostitutes, drug dealers, illiteracy. To get a GED in my family is a great accomplishment. We hardly ever see them. To not have a felony and being an adult male, or even 15, is almost unheard of. Because the roof has been taken off. There's no protection. So me, myself, I, I, I have 10 adult felonies. I've been in prison three times. I've been locked up in trunks. I've done things to people. I've hurt other people. Hurt people hurt people. We know that. I'm not excusing it, I'm just letting you know that the thing sometimes you read about in the newspaper, that beast you read in the newspaper, if you ever could see what made that beast, you might understand how to stop making them. So in my lifetime, I have seen the boogeyman come in many, 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 many different forms. I've seen him hurt so many people. I've seen him just destroy a person I've seen the beast just devour little babies. So what happened in my life? You know, if, if, I'm, if that happened to me, what happened? How, how am I standing here? I'm standing here because I can look back in my life and see where somebody came along. See, I was in the Red Wing State Reformatory for boys and I wouldn't go to school. At first I had been kicked out of every public school in Minnesota. You see, because they would send me to psychiatrists, but psychiatrists couldn't help me because they couldn't figure me out. It was like working on a car with no engine. 
I had no conscience. So a psychiatrist looks to hit the conscience. I had none. My conscience had been put to sleep. The boogeyman had came in, and the beast had came, and the beast put my conscience to sleep so that I could fight the boogeyman, and I got comfortable in that setting. So psychiatrists would try to help me and to no avail. So they would just lock me up. And one day I was going to the doctor. And this big, big guy, he was lifting weights out on a weight yard. And I said, hey, man, what you doing? Can I help? Can I do that? He said, I don't work with people that are idiots. And I said, oh, okay, he's big enough. He, he can get away with that one. So as I'm going to bring me back, he's still lifting weights, and I'm in handcuffs and shackles. I'm only about 15 years old. I'm at Red Wing State Reformatory. And I said, well, hey, man, what, what can I do, man? You show me that. He said, get your GED. In 30 days, I had my GED. 30 days. I just asked for the book, studied it myself. I was in solitary confinement and passed the test the first time simply because that man told me and inspired me to do that. It didn't completely take away the beast, but it pushed him far enough back so that I could accomplish something. And then I was sitting in Stillwater Prison, and a man from this organization called the Mekas, they send people to prison to visit young men like myself, in hopes that they would turn their life around. He was a college professor, and the man kept talking to me about, you got a GED, but that ain't gonna get you nowhere, Johnny. I'm like, okay, man, I ain't going to college. I ain't with all four, that's four years. He said, why don't you just take it one step at a time? Why don't you go to trade school? And I'm saying, man, that's in maximum security. I don't made it to minimum security, I ain't going. He said, well, you're wasting your life. I felt that that man cared about me. And just to repay his kindness, I went to school. Just simply that. Because hardly anybody had ever loved me. Out of that, I not only went to that school, I got out of prison, I went to school some more, and I became a computer programmer. From there, I became a teacher. Out of that experience. And then one day, I realized that the beast was still in me. Just some things about me had changed. And I got in the biggest trouble of my life. You know you're in big trouble when you're on the 9 o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news at that time, and you're the headline story, and it ain't for nothing good. You know you're in trouble. I was in the biggest trouble of my life. And there was a man that came to court, and he told the judge, if you will not send this man to prison, I'll hire him. He didn't have to do that. I'm looking at him like, man, you're crazy, man. I'm a three-time loser. I'm on probation or parole. And for some reason, just because another human being spoke up for this thing that this judge was looking at, I was a thing. I, got eight, I already had eight felonies, headed to 10, accused of 50, and the judge decided to give me a chance. That was 17 years ago. And in that 17 years, that same man has mentored me every single day of my life. And because I don't want to ever displease him, because he loves me, I do the best that I possibly can. We have chased the boogeyman and the beast. They're cowering in a corner somewhere because they are basically cowards. They don't dare come around my life because, see, I got a mentor. I got a mentor that I can call and say when they're knocking at the door. I got a mentor that I can call and say, hey, man, I don't know what to do with these things. The beast is trying to get me. Will you help me? Not with money or anything, with just advice and love and care and concern. And I know he'll be there. He'll answer the phone. That's all I needed in my whole life. He replaced the roof in my life. That is what I needed. So, you know, in my travels, I started hanging around with people. And 
this guy came along a little up 13 years ago, and he found value. I already knew the value of mentorship, but he found value in the street, going out in the street. And my whole family, I, I must tell you, started and runs the Rolling 30s Blood Street Gang. When we were called Murderapolis, some of you are too young to remember that, we were the family that caused that name to happen. But this guy would run amongst my family, who most people would see the beast in and would run away from, and he'd run towards them. He'd always want to hug them and talk and tell them how decent of a human being they were. At first, I didn't get it. But then I got it. What he was doing, he was an ex-drug dealer. He became a hope dealer. And that's what he called us. I said, man, what you doing? Man, I'm a hope dealer. I like that. Because that's what was missing in my life. Hope. I never knew I could aspire to be anything. Never knew I, a teacher? I've been a supervisor of operations, of third shift operations for Honeywell Avionics, okay? That's a long title, man. I've been that. This child that had no roof. And it took a simple thing, somebody to care enough to help me chase the boogeyman away. Now, me and my father, I almost killed him because when I became 15 years old and the beast fully had control of me, I pulled a gun on him and told him if he hit my mother again, I'd kill him. And because he was my father and because he took the roof off of my life, he knew I was telling the truth. So guess what? That's the last time my mother got hit. Now, I'm not proud that I had to do that to my father, but I'm very proud that he stopped hitting my mother. I can't explain how that felt. So here's what I want you to do. I want people to understand what a hope dealer is. A hope dealer is someone that just simply gives enough, gives a darn, cares enough about another human being to enter into a stranger's life and just offer hope. I'm not talking about emptying out your pockets. I'm not talking about going to extraordinary measures. I'm not talking about walking through gang territories. I'm talking about just caring enough to give enough, to give a little hope. People can do amazing things if, if once they realize that someone has their back. You don't have to look like them. You don't have to walk like them. Very few people walk like me. I've got this walk about me, you know. You can't see it on this stage. They got me a little confined. <laughs> you understand? But this man, my mentor, is 75 years old. He looks nothing like me. He doesn't, definitely doesn't walk like me. Does, definitely doesn't talk like me. And we come from different stratospheres. But he loves me. So we want to create a nation of hope dealers. We want people out there that care enough and hope enough to just give a little bit. We just want you to give a little bit. We don't need the whole thing. We just want a little bit. There's children out there that just need a little bit. They need a hope dealer to come along in their life. And together, guess what? We can fix 